Hello, and welcome to Encounters with Polish Literature, brought to you by the Polish Cultural Institute, New York. I'm David Goldfarb, and I'll be your host. We began our first episode by looking at points of contact between contemporary Polish literature and American culture. And I read poems by Czesław Miłosz, Wisława Szymborska, and Adam Zagajewski, the latter two in translations by Claire Kavanaugh. We are very fortunate to have Professor Kavanaugh with us today, and we had planned to discuss the work of Wisława Szymborska, but upon learning of the very recent passing of Adam Zagajewski on March 21st, 2021, we decided to save our discussion of Szymborska for next year and talk about the work of our friend Adam Zagajewski today. We'll look at some of Adam Zagajewski's poems that she has translated, including some works from his most recent collection published in Poland, which has not yet appeared in English. So if you don't read Polish, you'll hear them for the first time in English here. We'll also talk about how a translator works with a living author and what Adam Zagajewski was like as a professional colleague and as a friend. Before we meet our guest, I'd like to thank you all again for following our series, sharing links to our videos on social media and subscribing. If you check the YouTube description, you can find our playlist with all of our previous episodes. If you like what you hear, please click the thumbs up down below and leave us a comment. And if you haven't already done so, please hit the subscribe button and show our sponsors at the Polish Cultural Institute New York that you are interested and want to see more of what scholars, critics, translators, and eventually authors, I hope, have to say about Polish literature, its history, and its present. Let me introduce my friend and guest, Claire Kavanaugh, Francis Hooper Professor in the Arts and Humanities at Northwestern University. Claire Kavanaugh works on 19th and 20th century Russian, Polish, and Anglo-American poetry, and she has published many monographs, books of translation, edited volumes, and has won many awards and fellowships that you can read about on the webpage for this episode. Her book, Lyric Poetry and Modern Politics, Russia, Poland, and the West, from Yale University Press in 2010, received the National Book Critics Circle Award for Criticism. She is an associate editor of the revised Princeton Encyclopedia of Poetry and Poetics, which I always recommend to literature graduate students preparing for their comprehensive exams. She is currently working on an authorized biography of the Nobel Prize winning poet Czesław Miłosz with Farrar, Strauss, and Giroux. She is a, an acclaimed translator of contemporary Polish poetry. Her current works in progress include Wisława Szymborska's Advice to Authors, or How to Start Writing and When to Stop, which will come out from New Directions eventually, Adam Zagajewski, Real Life, from fs &G, and Adam Zagajewski, Collected Poems, also due to come out from fs &G. She has been elected to the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and has received fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the John Simon Guggenheim Memorial Foundation, the Social Science Research Council, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the Whiting Foundation. Clark Cavanaugh publishes regularly in the Times Literary Supplement, the New York Times Book Review, the New Republic, the New Yorker, the New York Review of Books, and her own critical works have been translated into several languages. Welcome, Claire. Thank you, and thank you for your nice introduction. <laughs> thank you. And thank for the project, and for the project. Thank you, thank you. I hope this is uh, this is uh, useful to you, and maybe you know if uh, if some of your students are interested, uh, that they'll that they'll uh, watch, and that's that's part of um, part of why we have this. Um, so, um, in our first episode, the the poem that I read um, was uh, the poem that I think is his most well known uh, poem in English. Um, try to praise the mutilated world which appeared um in the september 24th issue of the new yorker um i've gotten rid of all my copies of the new yorker when it all went digital uh, to save shelf space except this one um because it was so important to uh uh to all of us in new york i lived in new york at the time um to read this poem um which uh which um Adam Zagajewski did not write in the wake of 9-11. Uh, um, should we perhaps read it first? Sure, I'm happy to. Would you like to, to read? 
Why don't you, sure. read, since this is your translation, you're the poet. Try to praise the mutilated world. Try to praise the mutilated world. Remember June's long days and wild strawberries, drops of rosé wine. The nettles that methodically overgrow the abandoned homesteads of exiles. You must praise the mutilated world. You watch the stylish yachts and ships. One of them had a long trip ahead of it, while salty oblivion awaited others. You've seen the refugees going nowhere. You've heard the executioner sing joyfully. You should praise the mutilated world. Remember the moments when we were together in a white room and the curtain fluttered. We turned in thought to the concert where music flared. You gathered acorns in the park in autumn and leaves eddied over the earth's scars. Praise the mutilated world and the gray feather a thrush lost and the gentle light that strays and vanishes and returns. Thank you. That that's a, a wonderful translation, which uh, which I've noticed you've changed slightly um, since. I can tell you about that. One yeah. of the more embarrassing episodes in my history <laughs> as a translator. Although God knows Adam didn't let me know, <laughs> I made a mistake. This is what used to happen with with Adam. Used to send me his poems, he'd fax them to me and he'd done them on a typewriter. And that was in one batch. Mm -hmm. And they would be kind of blurry and a little crease down the side there. And what I did is drops of rosé wine. I did a bizarre autocorrect in the days before autocorrect. I did mm -hmm. it where rosé, I know perfectly well, I'm from California, perfectly easy. So what I did is I translated it back into Polish, assumed that the preposition O was where the crease was and that it was Orosia. What you had in the New Yorker was and wine and do. Yeah, the do was, was my mistake because of the blurry facts and because um, Gates has a great phrase, the fascination with what's difficult. I think anybody who gets into Polish stuff you're used to everything being hard. And so having a word that was obvious to me was too obvious and I made it harder. Anyhow, Adam told me much later that he caught the mistake, but didn't tell me because he mm -hmm. said, if, he said, at first I thought, what is this, a picnic at dawn? <laughs> And, and then I thought, oh, I kind of like it. And I said, you cannot just kind of like it. If there's a mistake, you got to let me know and I'll decide if we like it or not. You know, but it, so it's fixed in all the print editions afterwards. But he didn't, he, he was paying attention to other things, but he, he just let that one slide. It's an interesting sign of how, you know, those of us who translate are, it's never finished. I mean, we're just always revived. It oh. could be in print and here you are reading it and, and you, you tell me, I'll, I'll check the other print edition that I have. Is it, is it also changed from this one? Um, let's see. No, you've changed it to rosé wine in, in this edition. Yeah, and, exactly. Uh... It's correct in that edition and in the, the subsequent things, I think. But you never finish you just get to a point where you think you can't get it any better and the thing something that makes me um sad right now is i got two poems from adam on february 9th wow and what i always know is the versions he sends me in the initial burst of enthusiasm will be revised before the book form and that was another thing. Sometimes he failed to mention it to me. I would have translated a version. He would have put it in the book, put in a stanza break or two extra lines or taken out two lines or something and not tell me. So if I didn't check, the wrong version would go into the book. Um, and these, the two versions I got, they're, they're wonderful, but I won't ever know what they would have been the next time I saw them. Um, right. So... Right. So it's a work in progress on both sides, which mm -hmm. sometimes makes it difficult because you're doing a balancing act. Who's changing what, where, when, um, who catches it, who hates it, who likes it. 
Well, it's been fortunate that you've been able to work so closely with him. I mean, I mean, I as certainly as a critic, my preference until you know fairly recently has always been to work with you know dead writers who can't complain and and who can't change the text. You know? So so I'm always I'm all but but really it's a quite quite a different experience to work with somebody who's living and and can can change things in progress. Which is pretty much all I've ever done. Now I feel sad because I'm so used to it and it felt so wonderful. More than with um, Shimborska, who, who didn't speak English and also kept her workshop completely to herself. Adam, I wasn't in the workshop, but I would see things in progress and get him reacting to them and get him faxing them to me or emailing them to me. I would get them right away. I, the this one story I have with Vitsuava, which was another, I mean, now I'm I've kind of gotten not gotten used to it, but it's not my my first time around, where I've gotten a book or a poem or something, and the poet passes before I can finish it. And it goes from being the most recent to the last. And it's really hard to let I, I still can't make that transition yet. But Vitsuava sent out all her poems to her official translators via her, the indispensable Mihao Rushinek, who now heads the Shimborska Foundation. Um, so she sent us out the poems that were going to be uh, enough. And a couple of days later, we got an email saying, destroy this one and replace it with that. And I hadn't even read it yet, but I did it because that, for her, drafts were totally off limits. Adam, it wasn't, he never sent me a draft, but he never, and no, and it's not, he kept work. It's not that he kept working on them forever. He was different too, because what he would do was um, the translations, the poems he wrote last year, those are yesterday's papers. He's not going to mess with them. He's on to the new one, or he was, he was writing new poems when he took ill. Um, so he didn't fuss over my translations. Viswava kind of, she trusted me because she trusted Stanislav implicitly. And I was Stanislav's teammate for so many years. Stanislav Baranchak. Yeah, yeah. Right. Um, my friend and my teacher. Um, right. But every single one of them, I translated him and I translate Udisha Krinitsky, who doesn't speak English. So he kind of just let me do my thing and answered mm -hmm. questions if I had them. Stanislav was incredibly picky. And I would get, yeah, and he was a killer. He, he's read some of mine too. So I, I, I translated some very difficult poems of Michinsky, Stanislav, uh, of Tadeusz Michinsky, whom I've never, I haven't published them. I, I still think of them as works in progress. And I probably started them as a graduate student right. <laughs> decades ago. I know the uh, feeling. He wrote you know, very like detailed comments oh, on, on those poems. And with his own poems, I still have these somewhere. I just haven't gone through all my papers for all my my friends who are aren't around anymore. Um, he would do a version of one of his poems and take three or four different colors of markers to show the levels of rhyme scheme in them, which for him was fun. And for me, it's like somebody saying, solve a 3D chess problem in Polish. I mean, I would, I can't do graphs. I can't do, that's why I'm in <laughs> literature. Um, and I remember I translated one of his poems and he said, he wrote back a comment. He said, I think you've forgotten your medieval alchemy because this refers to this and this. I said, oh yeah, I, I just forgot about that. Like I ever knew medieval alchemy. <laughs> you know? it's, so it, it, they all, it's just so different from person to person. And with Adam, it was like, he would criticize things rarely and very cautiously. Um, and with Try to Praise was one of the poems he came back to me and I'd done it the way, more or less the way it is in, in there. He didn't let me know that it was rosé and not, but he said he wanted extol instead of praise. And extol does not come trippingly off the tongue in English. And extol opievach 
it's the same root it's spievach. so yeah. it's not like it's an alien word it's not um extol extol is more like liturgical i think exactly and and i'm catholic they don't even use it in mass not maybe they did in the olden days in latin i don't know but it's not it's not in songs it's not there's a billion hymns you can come up with praise him glorify his name but there's nothing with extol translations uh, of hebrew tend to have it it's in the haggadah the the maxwell house of ha maxwell house haggadah that we used as a family every year laud and extol you know is, that, somebody else told expression. me that but but <laughs> praise is what makes it into the the hymnal and into to you know catholic ritual at least i can't speak for the lutherans um <laughs> but so he wanted extol and he changed a couple of other words and i was kind of taken aback because he never did that he kind of basically unless i made a really obvious mistake and not even then he would catch it um he would just let it go he would let it go um and Alice Quinn told him that his version was wrong and mm. that mine was better. And after that, he was too afraid to criticize me. <laughs> so. Alice Quinn was the poetry editor of The New Yorker. Speaking of Alice Quinn discovering this poem, I know there's, you know, there's kind of an interesting story about how this just fell into place um, right after 9-11. So maybe you can, you know, maybe say a little about that story. And what was Adam doing when he actually, when did he actually write the poem and, and, and what was he thinking about? Um, well, it's really important, but interestingly enough, I didn't know it at the time. I knew it, I found out only, I knew the poem was before 9-11 because I got it before 9-11. I translated it before 9-11. It was all... I, I can't give you the exact time or the exact date when I first got the, the fax version, but um, he was traveling to Woof, and I found this out. There was an interview with him in Newsweek as the poet of 9-11 that came out. I don't, I don't even remember when. I have it all on file on my, my laptop. Um, he was traveling to Woof making a return trip to Lvoof, I believe, even with his father, and noticed all the depredations that had been taken on the landscape um, from the time that he didn't remember Lvoof, of course, but that the, the intervening decades, he had the myth of Lvoof he'd gotten imbued in him from childhood, but seeing everything that had happened to that part of the world is what inspired the poem. So it was really inspired by returning back to this beloved mythical city that haunts so much of his work. Um, then Alice Quinn uh, was looking at a stack of Adam's poems for the book that was coming out. And she said, she. I think what she told us was she could even see um, the the twin towers fall from her i think she was in lower manhattan or something and saw it out the window she could view or at least she could see the debris she could see and she said there's got to be a poem for this there's got to be a poem for this and she was flipping through the manuscript which had both the version i preferred and the version adam preferred in it um and she took the praise version and said this is it this is our poem um so that's how it happened. It was somebody who was witnessing the events as, or the aftermath of the events. Um, that's amazing that it was there at that time. Um, that's, you know, that's, that's really, really um, an incredible story. Maybe we should say about a few words about Lviv. I mean, I, you know, or as it's called today, Lviv, uh, or as it was called during the Soviet period, uh, Lvov, uh, or uh, Lemberg in Yiddish, or Lemberg in the Austro-Hungarian Empire. Um, and, you know, this transitory nature of, of Lviv, you know, it made me, has made me wonder, and I finally settled it today, what country was Adam Zagievsky born in when he was born in Lviv um, on June 21st of 1945, because the borders were passing you know, day by day, and you'd have to almost know what hour he was born at to know what country it was. Um, and I determined that it, I think he was born in uh, in German occupied Poland, um, because the Soviets, uh, the Soviets uh, 
controlled Lviv after September 22nd, so later in the year. Um, but the ambiguity of place, I think, and, and you know, the constant motion of a city, right? I mean, it's a city, like that's supposed to yeah. be in one place. Um, but that is such an unstable location, I think, uh, informs really, you know, all of his poetry. I mean, this idea of you know the place that's more imaginary than real, um, the you know, recurring reference that he he makes in all in many of his poems to Heraclitus and the river that you can't step in twice, um, and the idea of uh, transience uh, in uh, in uh, a defense of ardor. He talks about Plato's idea of uh, metaxu in betweenness, which is also your trans. Um, uh, which is uh, something that uh, appears in many places, and I'm sure we'll come back to. Um, but uh, for for people who don't, you know, know the history, maybe we should say a few words that uh, that at the end of World War II, um, at the Yalta Conference, uh, Poland's former Eastern lands were ceded to the Soviet Union. So that that meant that uh, Lviv, which had been a culturally Polish city, um, became part of uh, Soviet Ukraine, um, and uh, and Poland acquired lands uh, from. West Western, Western Poland or from Eastern Germany, um, uh, which included Silesia or Śląsk today, uh, and the town of uh, Gliwice. And, and uh, uh, Zagajewski's family was re relocated from uh, Lwów to uh, Gliwice. And for, you know, if you read memoirs of, of what happened at that time, I mean, it was all very strange to the people who came in. It was, you know, to these, these ethnic Poles who, or, and, you know, and perhaps a few Ukrainians who were relocated to this part of uh, this part of, you know, Poland on the on the German border it was strange to live in other people's houses and wonder are they coming back or are we here for good or you know this feeling of constant uh, constant transience we get that you know some sense of that from that that poem and from some of his some of his other works like uh, you know perhaps the most you know the one that's seen as foundational is to go to Lvov about this idea of going to this uh, this mythical city. Uh, but you've given us um, a new poem called Rain in Lvov. Uh, and maybe we can talk a little about that. Uh, is, is this published in Polish yet? Yes, yes. This one came out in the collection called Prawdziwe Życie, True Life. This poem really struck me. I'll say a few words if I can about to go to Lvov because Please. that was the first poem. I think it was 1983. I didn't meet Adam, but he gave a reading, which I think was his first ever English language reading. It was when um, Canvas, or was it Tremor or Canvas was the first one? Tremor. Tremor, I think. Yeah, it was, it was before Tremor came out. So it was 83, 84. Yeah, I think this came out in 85, didn't it? Yeah, and but the reading itself, I think, I don't remember if it predated it. It, it I left um, Cambridge in 1985. 85. So at some point before 1985, he came and gave one of his first English language readings, if not his first at Harvard, because his friend Stanislaw Baranczak was there. And I was in the audience with still lousy Polish, um, good enough to get me through my exams, but not good enough to hold a conversation <laughs> with a great poet. Um, and also I was just in awe of great poets and he read that poem and I just kind of like, wow, that's it, that's it. Um, he read it in, in Polish and in English. And I would feel silly saying this, except Derek Walcott had the same experience. It was mind blowing. It was mind blowing. I just knew that was a great poem. So I went over to the library and Harvard has an amazing library. And I just found everything on the shelves that I could that had Adam Zagajewski poems in them. So that was how I got started reading Adam when he finally approached me to translate him, which was 95. Um, he did it through an intermediary, a mutual acquaintance because as it turned out much later, he was intimidated by me because he'd read a book I'd written on Mandelstam that mm. he thought she's a really serious scholar. She's not gonna, you know. Um, and <laughs> I was intimidated because it was Adam Zagajewski. And 
I thought, oh my God, I can't translate Adam Zagajewski. And also I felt this pang, like I've always translated with Stanislav. I can't just, you know, stop translating with, you know, I felt like it was a betrayal and I got off the phone. You can cut this if you want, but I got off the, I turned him down because I was too intimidated. <laughs> That's going to stay. <laughs> because I was too intimidated and I got off the phone and my husband said, first thing he said was, you're an idiot. Then the next thing he said was, it's translating, not sex. You can do it with more than one person. So <laughs> I got back on the phone and said, no, 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 I'll do it. I'll do it. But I was really terrified. I just felt like, man, this guy is so the real deal. And who am I? So it was maybe a year and a half or so before we ever even actually met in person. We just used to talk over the phone. So that's how I ended up translating him. Um, but I was struck because, so to go to Wolf is still, every time I read that poem, I just, I think it's magnificent. And then I, I heard it coming back again in this poem, which I'm still thinking about. I mean, the translation is, is good enough to read on the air, but I'm still thinking about how this poem works. Rain in Lwof. And it has an epigraph. It falls on Vavil's dragon. It falls on giant's bones. That's from Tadeusz Hrushevich, Rain in Krakow. It falls on the Armenian Cathedral and on the Union Church of St. George, on the Opera House and on Blackstone Apartments. Hills vanish in the mist. And Ostap Otvin, who was a valiant man, he defended Stanisław Brzozowski. Brzozowski, shot on the street by the Gestapo. Civilization has five syllables, pain only one. In London, I saw Van Eyck's self-portrait inscribed as it can, that is, as best I can, and it is not a selfie. Rain falls on the Scottish cafe and on the high castle, on the Kaiserwald and on the synagogue, and this hill which sat on seven hills like Rome, excuse me, and the city which sat on seven hills like Rome with its scepter and orb grew flat and small. Tram wheels screeched on their tight tracks and all of us wept, bypassers and guests, victors and vanquished. Something kind of curious there, just a little biographical detail is that I know that um, on the ma on the main square in uh, Lviv, uh, one of the most famous buildings is the Black House, um, which is this black stone building uh, in the on the main square. And I also know that in Chicago, he lived on South Blackstone Avenue. Um, <laughs> so I wonder if there's some. Did he write it in Chicago by chance? <laughs> No, no, because no. this is relatively recent and yeah. he hasn't been in Chicago in five or he hadn't been in Chicago for five years. He retired at 70. So the Blackstone Apartments was me improvising because I, I'd have to look it up, but you'll probably identify with this. There's some words that are so hard. Kamienica is one of them, you know, because brownstone, that's New York. Graystone, we know what that means in Chicago. But apartment house is totally wrong mm -hmm. you need to have something that's pre-war and made out of stone and not some flimsy stucco clapped so i don't know how i've done it in different places but here i went with stone apartments because it shouldn't just be house because a communita is typically multiple so that one that's a bit of an improvisation they're definitely black and it's a communita mm -hmm. is it plural or singular let me I mean, since this one is so recent, I mean, I've just been working on these over the last couple of months um, intensively. Um, I still remember every, well, I'm sure you, you get this part too. Yeah, it's, one, it's singular, but I, I turned it into apartments. Yeah. And part of it is is apartment buildings is too clunky, black stone apartment building. You need Caminita, I can visualize exactly. I've lived in them. I'm I've stayed in them, you know, but it's 
it's the kind of improvisation you, you have to do. Unit Church was the same thing because I, I don't know how I translated before the World Wide Web because I could look up every one of these places and see what they look like and figure out what to not, because Tzerkev is usually Orthodox, but I could check this exact church and it was Unit. So I could, I, I wanted it to be Unit because he's doing Armenian, this is like in, in Tegod Lvuf, Armenian Cathedral, Unit Church of St. George, um, Scottish Cafe, High Castle, Kaiserwald Synagogue. He's compressing the whole history of Lvuf into buildings, you know, these where you have multiple religions, um, multiple kinds of culture, Kaiserwald, Scottish Cafe, I checked that, there are so I could get that exactly right. Coming from Lvov, um, Zagajewski kind of came to his own and in, into his own in the 1970s, uh, really before that poem uh, to return to uh, Lvov. Um, and I think, you know, today we should focus mostly on his later poems, since those are the ones that um, that you translated. And since we have you here, uh, the earlier poems were mostly translated by uh, Renata Gorczynski, not all of them, um, but um, but uh, I should, in the meanwhile, for those who want to understand, like, you know, the context of, of Zagajewski and the Polish Nova Fala, the new wave, um, I highly recommend, there was recently a very good uh, talk given by Jarosław Anders um, as part of the Kościuszko Foundation uh, Hunter College Literary Series. We won't be dwelling on that period, I think, today, but if you want to see that, I recommend going to uh, thekf.org, that's the Kościuszko Foundation website, thekf.org, just the letters KF, um, with the in front, uh, and then click events, um, and you can find uh, this event in the list. And also next year, uh, we're planning to have a more extensive discussion of the new wave uh, in relation to the underground poetry of the Solidarity era um, with uh, Katarzyna Zechenter uh, from University College London. So we can look forward to that. But uh, just to establish that foundation, let's look at one of those uh, early poems. You suggested your translation of uh, Philosophers, um, which uh, gives, you know, gives a, a kind of a, a picture of that. And that's, uh, that's included in uh, the collection Without End, New and Selected Poetry. This is from his period as a, a Nova Fala, as a, a, a new wave poet, um, where part of what the goal was, was to restore language to concrete realia in PRL, in People's Poland, um, and to block the linguistic sort of political social phantasmagoria that was uh, self speak basically, and find an alternative to that. But going back to these poems now, and this is the uh, the difficult thing about going back when Adam writes beautifully about this in other poems about when the poet has died, when the person has died, everything looks different. And I can see the continuities much more strongly than I used to be able to. And that's true in this poem. He himself had training in psychology and philosophy. So the philosophy would have been on his mind. Everybody was forced to read certain philosophers. Uh, as part of their um, higher education in um, People's Poland. So when you get to a line, and I'll read the poem in just a moment, um, uh, about stop deceiving as philosophers, work is not a joy, man is not the highest goal. He's clearly addressing very specific philosophers who'd been forced down everybody in school. He even talks about it at one point that he made money having to go out to workers' places. One of his jobs was going out to workplaces and lecturing really unhappy workers who were forced to stay overtime or something about Marxist-Leninist philosophy. And this is kind of his, his answer to that. And there are terms in here that are really specific the time and place, but there's some other things that I think even a poem like Try to Praise, you can see the continuities. Um, anyhow, this is a poem called Philosophers. Stop deceiving us, philosophers. Work is not a joy, man is not the highest goal. 
Work is deadly sweat. Lord, when I get home, I'd like to sleep, but sleep's just a driving belt transporting me to the next day and the sons of fake gold, excuse me, and the sons of fake coin. Morning rips my eyelids, sealed as before birth. My hands are too gastarbeiter, and even my tears don't belong to me. They participate in public life like speakers with chapped lips and a heart that's grown into a brain. Work is not a joy, but incurable pain, like a disease of the open conscience, like new housing projects through which, through which the citizen wind passes in his high leather boots. Now, this to me is one of his, the poems from the early period. This is a real poem. There's a lot going on in here, and there's a lot going on that will be to what Adam will turn to when he, in fact, rejects um, the new wave. and. Uh, the idea of the poet as the voice of the people, as the voice of the collective, the, the repressed voice of the collective. Here, the first thing he's doing is he's speaking in the voice of a worker, which is a typical thing for the new, new wave poets, the, the gray man, the normal man, the ordinary man. But he's saying ordinary isn't ordinary. And this is also key to Adam's poetry, I think. Um, in Try to Praise a Mutilated World, what he the poet is talking to himself in that poem and commanding himself, you know, you have to praise the world now, how, no matter how awful it looks and you have your moments that are entirely personal that no one else can remember. And those moments will, they're kind of like the gentle light that strays and vanishes. It's, it's got images of light, you know, with the window and the wind blowing in. Here, this is about, uh, a working man who's utterly alienated from himself, who needs to have his private self restored. I'd like to sleep. Work, is, work does not take the place of that. Sleep is a driving belt because you just wake up the next day and go back to the office. The sun is fake. My eyes are sealed. My hands are gastarbeiter, guest workers, which makes it very specific too, alienated from his own hands. My tears don't belong to me. They participate in public life. That's part, you need to have your tears. You need, you, you belong to your tears. Your tears belong to you. Your heart isn't a separate organ. Um, and everything that should be private, new housing projects, very specific to PRL, um, citizen win, nature is now part of PRL too. It's part of the official state. We should say that PRL refers to the Polish People's Republic. Uh, sorry, so sorry. So that's yeah, communist Poland, yeah. in other words. Communist Poland, people's, quote unquote, people's Poland. But what he's doing is giving an individual worker a voice that says something is wrong with the world I inhabit and something is wrong with the self I ostensibly inhabit. And that's very much what Adam does going forward is saying, ordinariness is not ordinary. Ordinariness demands moments of radiance and desires it as this speaker does here. You should have your own tears. Uh, your tears shouldn't be like speakers with chapped lips. Um, your heart shouldn't be just an organ of the brain. In other words, rationality is not the... Um, and he moves forward. So I think in this poem, he's already working towards the self he wants to liberate, the poetic voice he wants to liberate when he breaks with the idea of poetry as the voice of the collective. He's not saying, I don't care about ordinariness. He's saying ordinariness does not exist as a general phenomenon that we all participate in equally. Ordinariness is part of the privilege of having your own separate individual life that can only be described, however imperfectly, in language that belongs to that life. That's that's very interesting. I mean, I, I you know I'm, I've been thinking as I've been reviewing these these poems for today's discussion about you know this constant you know movement between you know sort of the feeling of transience and the everyday and seeing these ordinary you know sort of scenes in Lvov or you know wherever um, you know in, in, even in the presence of great art um, and then uh, punctuated by mo these moments of transcendence. 
um, of uh, whether it's you know his poems about music, uh, whether it's his, his poems about uh, about the visual arts, about painting, um, uh, which themselves are often about uh, about the everyday. I mean, like Shimborska, I think you know they both had a fascination yeah. for the you know the Dutch Golden Age, uh, the still life, um, you know things that things that were in, you know entirely. I mean, and it's also about a kind of elegiac stance toward the you know the everyday, like something just how memory can can produce its own trans you know transcendence out of something that you know you know was just a dead fish or something like that i mean uh, you know in in the in the paintings of uh, of of the dutch the dutch masters um let's see um maybe you know we might you know say uh you know a few words about one of his poems on that which which you translated on that topic uh, called ordinary life um, which I think you know deals with this this idea of you know transience and trans transcendence. Um, this uh, this movement between you know bef between the ordinary and and uh, and uh, brilliance. I'll read this one: um, "Ordinary Life," uh, which is translated by Claire Cavanaugh. Uh, and written by Adam Zagajewski. And this appeared, I have the version that appeared in the print edition of the November 26th, 2007 issue of The New Yorker. So, Ordinary Life. Our life is ordinary. I read in a crumpled paper abandoned on a bench. Our life is ordinary, the philosophers told me. Ordinary life, ordinary days and cares, a concert, conversation, strolls on the town's outskirts, good news, bad, but objects and thoughts were unfinished somehow, rough drafts. Houses and trees desired something more, and in summer green meadows covered the volcanic planet like an overcoat tossed upon the ocean. Black cinemas crave light. Forests breathe, free, forests breathe feverishly. Clouds sing softly. A golden oriole prays for rain. Ordinary life desires. It even has the philosophers in there again, and it has the fragility of the green grass on our volcanic planet. You can see where these different periods tie together in the poetry, but um, in the print edition, um, Adam dedicated this poem to me. Oh, um, wow. <laughs> which now it makes me so happy that I have that and in the, the book edition. And I remember what I wrote to him when, when I saw that I said, I feel temporarily immortal, which is basically, <laughs> basically what it is, but it's ordinary life in the first place, it's fragile. It is the green surface across a volcanic planet um, and not to be taken for granted, which fits in with what you were saying about transience. The ordinary life he celebrates from his, his family in Lvoof was, you know, his aunts fussing over their little sachets, but we know what's going to happen to the sachets and to the ants and to the history. And he even brings that up in the, the poem about rain in um, Lvoof, where um, the, oh gosh, now I forgot, uh, Ostap Ortvin dies, which is true. Yes, is shot by the Gestapo, you know, mm -hmm. so that all of this stuff is incredibly fragile, which is exactly why we have to keep reminding ourselves to praise it, because isn't this miraculous, this one little moment, sitting on a park bench, you read a crumpled up newspaper, all, you know, but that moment is extraordinary, and that his job is in a way to, to bring that tiny second of banality, me wiping my nose from hay fever. <laughs> I'd say, isn't that amazing? It's because things are growing outside that I'm responding to and which I love um, that I can even, I even have the joy of having a runny nose this time of year. Let's look at another, another poem that you suggested we look at today, um, Boogie Woogie, because that seems to bring together both like this you know, I, I mean, it seems to be an art reference, if I've got it right, um, and uh, which I'll let you explicate, or I'll try to explicate if 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 you don't want to. Uh, that uh, you know, and at the same time, uh, it's describing something completely mundane uh, that happens 
um, you know, kind of as if these two kind of things are conjoined. Um, maybe, maybe before we talk about it, you should read it. Okay. Is this also a, a one that hasn't this is been brand, published? Brand uh, well, new? not brand new. It's from it's from the the what I'm still going to be calling the most recent volume. Mm -hmm. um, Wookie, the translation Wookie. is new. The translation is new. I've just been kind of going over all this stuff. It's right. actually up on my desktop, on the not on my laptop right now. Um, Boogie Woogie, you shout from the other room. You ask me how to spell Boogie Woogie. And instantly I think, what luck? No war has been declared. No fire has consumed our city's monuments, our bodies, our dwellings. The river didn't flood. No friends have been arrested. It's only Boogie Woogie. I sigh relieved and say it's spelled just like it sounds, Boogie Woogie. Yeah, I love that poem. Um, so I'm glad you pulled that one out. It seems like, um, you know, I mean, that, it, you know, since I, knowing you know, what he writes about music and, and, and poetry, that it, it, you know, it might be referring to, you know, to Mondrian's painting, uh, Pierre Mondrian's uh, Broadway Boogie Woogie, um, which is, you know, a visual representation of a musical work in a sense, like this, uh, this uh, painting that tries to convey, it, this might be totally off base, of course, uh, that tries to convey um, rhythm through visual organization, through uh, through uh, vertical and horizontal lines and blocks of color, um, and uh, and Mondrian painted that painting in 1943. He came to New York in 1940. Uh, he was fleeing the war, um, fleeing fascism, um, and uh, and here there's. You know, you know, we can imagine that, you know, that uh, this is probably Maya asking him, you know, how do you spell, uh, spell Boogie Woogie? Um, and, uh, you know, and then him reflecting, you know, there's no war that's been declared, you know, that, that somehow there's this, this kind of uh, connection between the present and the past um in this expression boogie woogie that comes together in the poem again could be totally off but uh but that's 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 my my first read having seen this first for the first time this morning <laughs> well it's very interesting to me because i know that painting we're talking about but i didn't know what year it was from and i wonder if that that's like a little link way through the other thing that i liked about it is Adam liked jazz a lot and jazz references come up in his poems and in one little line he was so pleased I liked it from Asymmetry he had a poem about Rue Armand Sylvestre and he he kind of was dismissive but I there was one I said he's he was he would get embarrassed when he fussed about his stuff um but I said, my gosh, you had to have written that poem if for nothing else, the sparrows continuously dance the Lambeth walk and shimmy. I just love that line because it, Lambeth walk and shimmy is so specific and so obscure. Like they were popular in the twenties. And, but it also, sparrows do dust baths. And they do bounce around in that. And I just said, Adam, if only for that line, you had to have written that poem. Because he was kind of, I said, oh, I love that. And he kind of, um, but he he knows all these specifics about jazz, you know, about Dave Brubeck. What, he has a poem called How High the Moon. Mm -hmm. um, so the, the book, it doesn't even actually conflict with what you're saying. Because, of course, what Mondrian is doing is trying to translate jazz into painting images yeah and that that his first thought when i i assume it's the same thing his wife shouts from the other room i love a poem where somebody shouts from the other room to begin with and asks you how to spell something because we've all been there right it's as ordinary as can be um and his first thought is thank heavens it's none of these things and he runs through everything that could have happened and has happened the river didn't flood. Anybody who knows about Krakow knows that, you know, periodically there have been terrible floods, um, arrests. 
but it's only boogie woogie and it's spelled just like it sounds. There's no conflict between the word and the, the spelling. Everything lines up. But of course, it's not really spelled like it sounds because boogie woogie is super American. You right. Know? Yeah, that's that's an amazing moment. Um, the, the poem that I think interested me the most of the ones that you sent, um, especially the new ones, was this uh, poem, The Calling of St. Matthew, uh, which is, again, one of these moments of, you know, transience and transcendence kind of coming together. I mean, the, the calling of St. Matthew refers to the, the painting by Caravaggio. This is one of the poems. He gave me a copy of it, you know, sent it to me over email. I, when I was in Krakow, actually, in 2018, and he changes them. And so the version that came out in the book um, is a little bit different. The first one was dedicated to Szymborska. This one just has an epigraph for Szymborska, uh, The Calling of St. Matthew. And, and I'll just mention one other thing because I, I knew exactly what he was talking about because of being in Rome with an event with Bob Haas and Adam and Italian poets and translators in 2012. And I was wandering around and went into a church just opposite the Pantheon. And I'm just walking through the church and it's dark and suddenly somebody puts the money in the meter and a Tinderetto lights up and I'm going, what? And so you can see the Tinderetto for two minutes and then the light goes out. And I, I didn't know what kind of coin, so I had to stand there and wait until somebody else fed the meter. And he's writing about, it, I, that kind of experience. Just one other side thing is he has another beautiful poem earlier called Senza Flash. It was another when I, I have epiphanies after the fact. Adam was writing about Italy. I was taking, I accidentally took a flash photo of a picture in Rome and the lady came up and yelled at me, Senza Flash. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, it's just like Adam's poem. So um, I love these for multiple reasons, but that's one of them. Anyhow, The Calling of St. Matthew. That priest looks just like Belmondo, Viswava Szymborska, funeral too. And he's borrowed the form from Viswava, from Szymborska. Look at his hand, his palm, like a pianist. But that old guy can't see a thing. What next? Paying in a church. Mom, my head aches. Sharply individuated human figures. Keep it down, please. We can't focus. The coins on the table, how much are they worth? His operation's just three weeks away. I'd say silver, definitely silver, but not pure. Lord, how lovely. To adorn the Contarelli Chapel. Which one is Matthew, the young guy or the old? We almost got robbed in the subway today. Two generations of European artists took it as their model. Look, there's a cross in the window. The light went out again. The wall on the left is so black, like the world's end. Have you got another euro or 50 cents? Can't be the young guy. They're closing soon, hurry up. He saw a man collecting taxes. How much are these paintings insured for? Jesus is in shadow, but his face is light. I'm leaving now, I'll wait outside. Why don't they have a guard? They live in semi-darkness and suddenly there's light. It's going out. What's your read on it before I offer mine? I love that I knew that experience of waiting for the coin and not having the right coin and just being a stupid tourist in a church and not. And I loved it that it was first dedicated to Szymborska and then just has the one little quote because he's he's using something I haven't seen him do before. And this is something I'm really going to miss is watching him change of taking all the voices where you just eavesdrop on what's happening around you. And part of it is pure ordinariness. You know, you're in with a bunch of tourists and the focus is supposed to be the painting, but everybody's talking and the machine takes money and you have to stop periodically. Um, and the ordinariness is built into it. And one easy way to read it would be to say, you're supposed to cut out all the voices that say, mom, my head aches and do you have 50 cents? But no, that you can't experience this any other way. It's all built into the experience. And that it's not privileging 
the aesthete saying, look at his hand, his palm, like a pianist's, a line that you could attribute to someone like Adam who loved music and painting, or to adorn the Cotterelli Chapel, the person who knows history, or uh, three, what is the line about? Two generations of European, the art historical voice, the tour guide voice, and the person saying, how much is the money on the table worth? And, and there's money in the picture and money being fed into the meters. These worlds are kind of in interchange, but it's also about revelation, you know? And it fits with Caravaggio because darkness and light and what is illuminated in the Caravaggio painting and what is illuminated briefly is the painting and how much of the painting can you see? And the painting itself is about Jesus in a shadow, in, um, is in shadow, but his face is light. Um, the wall on the left is so black like the world's end. Um, apocalypse is just part of a little everyday experience and you never experience anything completely. You know, regardless of whether you've got the right coins or not, you're only going to experience it in flashes and fragments and interrupted dailiness. That's that's my read on that, it. That's interesting. I mean, it, I came to a very similar kind of conclusion at first looking at it and saying, well, you know, in a defense of ardor, he's, you know, he's talking about, you know, he's defending the idea of uh, of this you know these transcendental moment these transcendent moments these moments of the sublime and here he is talking about you know the banality of you know of going to a museum and the everyday and putting your money in the you know to turn on the light um and but you know but that isn't that what the painting is about right i mean that uh you know in you know this is the moment in matthew 9 9 where you know matthew is calling on the tax collector right or jesus is calling on the tax collector to follow him um and in the moment of his complete you know banality he's being called to this higher spiritual uh spiritual calling and uh and you know maybe that's what the poem tries to create I, you know it's uh you know exactly this this kind of com you know combination of of the everyday and the banal and 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 the the, the sublime moment which is in fact i mean it's one reason to appreciate the gospels regardless of your your own religious is because of how much banality there is in there you know who does this coin belong to how many sheep have you lost uh, all of these things matter and someone hiding up in a tree waiting to see jesus counts who's an outcast because he deals in money um but money is part of that that world. Jesus doesn't say, let's all go cash free, which we've all done anyhow, because now we use plastic. But he's not, Jesus doesn't say that. And Adam isn't saying that. And a, a line I, I really like from Paul, and I can't remember, I can't give you the, um, we know in part, and we prophesy in part. Partial revelation is all we ever get. And let's not try and pretend it lasts and let's not try and pretend it belongs in a different realm than the banal, the ordinary, the everyday. Um, which is why the, the cliche in Poland, particularly of Adam as an esthete who only values artistic experience, um, who's a snob, who's all, you know, if you're not, you know, listening to Schubert or hanging out in, um, the the museum you're not you don't count no it all counts he's trying to defend inner lives of human beings like the guy in the philosophers um like try to praise nobody said oh this poem is just about adam meditating on the beautiful thing about you know having some rosé everybody was able to internalize that poem because it's saying it is so hard it is almost impossible. And here it goes again. The world is always being mutilated. You know, the, the cherished moments are always in danger of annihilation. But your job is to reach in and dig them up and 
keep that as a way to keep yourself going. That's exactly what Adam is doing, I think. I think you're right. Yeah. Um, so if we can move from the sublime to the banal, or not sure. so banal, uh, let me ask you, um, thank you so much for you know, presenting your, 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 your translations here and for you know, joining me for a short discussion. Of, oh, uh, complete pleasure, David. Of, um, thank uh, you. I've asked uh, everybody to you know say a little you know a little about uh, their uh, their program if they teach, uh, and uh, so could you say a few words for you know graduate students or or aspiring graduate students who might be uh, watching this program about uh, about studying Polish at Northwestern? Well, not just graduate students because we have an undergraduate program that has taken a lot of work to sustain because <laughs> it only started I think in two thousand three. And we've been doing it on a wing and a prayer for years and years. And graduate students, well, I'll, I'll brag about two of them because if anything can draw you, this will be it. My two graduate students who graduated in Polish and comparative literature were Jennifer Croft, the now extremely famous author in her own right and brilliant translator of Olga Tokarczuk with Antonia Lloyd-Jones. I've been giving those books for presents to everybody. Those translations sing. We'll be having her on the show later this year. And, and in the last episode, um, Bojana Shalkros, you know, said the, very much the same thing about uh, Jennifer Croft, because she said that she was the only person uh, who was not a po native Polish speaker who turned in a paper in Polish for Bojana's course. That doesn't course. surprise me. Um, she's also one of the most linguistically gifted. She's in this tiny percentage who assimilates languages so quickly that I had to tell her to stop learning languages and finish her dissertation because she's she's phenomenal. Um, but the other one is Stanley Bill, who directs the Polish program at Cambridge. So those are my two PhDs in comparative literature in Polish who, you know, I keep feeling like if I did nothing else. Stanley will be on the show next year and he'll be talking about Sienkiewicz. Sienkiewicz. Oh, that'll looking forward looking forward mm -hmm. yeah but they're they're phenomenal but we've also had with this program operating on a wing and a prayer um i think seven or eight fulbrights to poland and not in you know, a wide range of fields but people who get caught up you know what was an undergraduate in geology i think was one of them um, we've had all sorts of people in all kinds of fields get caught up in Polish. And I would say informally about a third of our majors and minors are Polish, you know, major minor as a focus. So we're still trying to keep things up and running. Did that happen to you at Harvard? I've heard many stories of people who were came in as Russianists and just because of Baranchak's, you know, magnetism got caught up in Polish, as you say. <laughs> Well, it it was a little bit more complicated than that because I was his first ever graduate student. And when I get into this, it really dates me. But what what the hell? Um, I had to pick a quote unquote second Slavic language in 1980. Baranchek wasn't at Harvard yet, but everybody kept saying this great poet dissident, he, he's going to get here. We're going to get him finally to come. He'd had his visa denied year, year after year for this three-year appointment, which is all he intended to do originally. And I was kind of going, oh my gosh, you know, I'm doing Old Church Slavonic, I'm doing Russian, I'm, I'm going to do something else. I thought, okay, every day in the papers, it's Miłosz gets a Nobel Prize. I've read some of Miłosz, so I thought, okay, Miłosz in, in English, Miłosz gets a Nobel Prize, there's Wenza, there's the Pope, there's Solidarity, what the hell? I'm going Polish. And Baranchek came the next year and got stuck because of, of martial law. He couldn't go back, which was disastrous for his family. I still remember, you know, their reaction, but not for me, purely selfishly, not for me. And um, he was he was the greatest. And we started translating, I think, around 82, 83, when I was his research assistant. And that's what got me hooked. I mean, there's no going back then. Plus the Baranchaks were like my home away from home when I was at Harvard, they were so wonderful.
it's great that you have such strong students at uh, Northwestern. It's a small program, um, but uh, but an outstanding program. Um, so thank you for uh, sharing that with us, um, and thank you again for uh, for being here. Um, I should thank some more people um, before we close out. Uh, uh, first of all, let me uh, say that uh, that. Uh, uh, you should remember to subscribe if you'd like to see more of this. Um, and we should thank the Polish Cultural Institute New York, directed by Robert Czarniawski, um, which uh, supports and hosts our show. Uh, Bartek Remisko, uh, who is the uh, Humanities and Literature Program Director at uh, the Polish Cultural Institute New York. Uh, and he's the one who suggested this series and acts as our executive producer. Um, our wonderful editor, Natalia Iudin, um, and fellow producer who handles uh, all the technical and aesthetic aspects of this production, and Claudia Ovona Draber um, at uh, the Polish Cultural Institute New York, who uh, is the head of communications and makes sure that everybody finds out uh, about all of our new episodes. So thank you all for listening and reading along with us. Um, let's meet again in a month when we'll be discussing the work of one of my favorite authors, uh, the Polish Jewish writer and visual artist who is another writer who uh, reaches through the banal to find the transcendent. Um, and I'll be speaking with my good friend and fellow Schulzolog, as we call ourselves, specialist in Bruno Schultz, uh, Karen Underhill, who teaches at the University of Illinois, Chicago. So see you next month. Thank you very much. Can't wait.